Ah oui, euh, bon, d'abord, merci à tout le monde qui est venu pour, pour voir cette conférence. Je m'appelle Hector Galvez, je suis spécialiste en bioinformatique dans le centre euh, Canadian Center for Computational Genomics, donc C3G à McGill, au centre génomique McGill. Um, je suis partie de l'équipe euh, TechDev là-bas, donc euh, vraiment euh, l'équipe qui fait les développements de pipelines et de nouvelles technologies et, et donc on est chargé de, de faire euh, les projets de longue durée par exemple dans, dans les centres pour être les supports et, et bon, bon c'est mon rôle là-bas. Je suis là depuis trois ans déjà. Et donc maintenant, je vais parler un petit peu sur le projet VirusSeq, qui c'est un projet COVID qui a commencé bon, l'année dernière avec euh, la pandémie. Et la conférence va être en anglais en fait, mais vous pouvez me, me poser cette question en français et même euh, euh, après la conférence euh, ou pendant la conférence, vous pouvez me poser des questions par, euh, pour... Euh, pour n'importe quelque chose euh, en français ou en anglais. Donc, si ça va pour tout le monde, je vais commencer et je vais faire les switch uh, en anglais. Um, for those of you that don't uh, understand French, I'm just going to repeat a little bit. I'm a bioinformatics analyst at the Canadian Center for Computational Genomics at McGill. And uh, I'm going to talk about the VirusSeq project at the McGill Genome Center, which is a project that was um, that is ongoing and that is related to the COVID um, sequencing effort that is a part of Cancogen uh, and a Canadian level, uh, supported by Genome Quebec and by several other funding partners. So uh, the, the focus of the project will be on the pipelines that we use for sequencing the virus and the results that we have obtained up until 2020. So uh, the first part of this talk will be really about the, the, how the sequencing works and how the pipelines work for SARS-CoV-2. Um, just as a brief introduction for anyone that's not familiar with how the technology works. So at McGill, Uh, and really worldwide, there uh, what we tried uh, two main approaches to sequencing the virus. Uh, both of these approaches are amplicon based. So what you have essentially is a series of primers that amplify specific regions of the virus genome, and those regions uh, called amplicons tile across the whole genome. So. Uh, Here in the slide, if you can see the red dot, uh, the pointer, um, there are a number of blue lines that represent the amplicons. And over here in the top, we have the virus genome. And the one that we use currently, uh, and that is one of the ones that's used most worldwide, was developed by a consortium called the Arctic Network. And so they developed their amplicons using um, um, long read technology as a baseline. So Nanopore to, uh, specifically was kind of like their main sequencing technology. And so the amplicons themselves are about roughly 450 base pairs in size, and they tile across the whole genome with these overlaps uh, between each amplicon um, kind of uh, closing any gaps in the, in the coverage that you would have so that you can actually cover the almost all of the viral genome. Another amplicon strategy that we tried was developed by a company called Paragon Genomics. It's called Cleanplex and it's a similar concept to the Arctic amplicons, except that you have much shorter amplicons here in green and you can see them up here too. Um, this technology was developed with short reads in mind And we tried it out and it works well, but we decided to go with the Arctic uh, protocol for many reasons, but in part because uh, we do use long reads for some of our sequencing. Uh, 
and also because it's a much more supported um, uh, Amplicon strategy worldwide, uh, and it's what most of the Canadian uh, partners, uh, members of Kangagen use. So it, it had several advantages. So the pipelines were designed uh, based off this Amplicon strategy and based off the work that a number of uh, other people worldwide have been doing, specifically, obviously, the Arctic Network, um, which is based off the UK, but also our Canadian partners at Cancogene. And so uh, I'm going to talk first about the Illumina pipeline, which is a pipeline that uh, we use for all short read technologies. Right now, we're mostly using Illumina for our short read sequencing. But at the beginning, we used MGI as well, which is another kind of short read sequencer. And so this pipeline was developed by uh, Paul, a member of our team, um, who uh, used, it, used uh, another pipeline called Signal as a template and also our internal pipeline uh, framework called GenPipes to kind of put together this whole um, process. And because this talk is geared mostly towards bioinformaticians, I can go into a little bit more depth about what each step is doing. But um, essentially, we've kind of binned them into these general categories. So we begin with host removal, which is um, a series of steps that essentially make sure that the reads that we that go into the analysis have no host uh, information, mostly uh, for privacy reasons as well and for sharing the data. So uh, what we do initially is align all reads to a combined uh, reference that has the, the human genome and the virus genome. And then we use uh, a filtering step to remove any reads that map into the human genome with uh, any mapping quality above or equal to zero. We remove those reads from the analysis and then we just keep um, paired end reads that have all, both reads mapping to the viral genome uh, as part of the rest of the, the pipeline. And then um, we do some trimming to remove uh, low quality um, bases, to remove um, uh, any reads that have a less than 20 base pairs in length once you remove the low quality basis. Um, but crucially for the trimming, we, we currently are not trimming the primers that are used for sequencing. In this step, we do that down the line using uh, another tool for trimming the primers specifically. Um, after this initial like quality trimming, we go into the actual alignment that we'll, we, that we'll use for our analyses. And so the purpose of all of our pipelines and the purpose of this virus sequencing effort, at least in the COVID um, uh, context, is for detecting variants. And I'm sure, pretty sure a lot of you have heard all this talk about variants in um, the news media and obviously if you follow the scientific uh, publishing there, there's been a lot of talk about variants there so uh, what we want in this virus sequencing effort is to detect those variants and to produce a consensus sequence from any given sample that we receive at the sequencing center and so uh, when we when i'm describing the rest of the steps you have to keep in mind that the goal of the pipeline is to do this, to produce a consensus sequence and to detect variants. And uh, to do that, the first few steps after you know, the host removal and the quality trimming are related to an alignment that is gonna be really the basis of everything else that comes down the line. The alignment is to the virus genome, this time the virus genome on its own, um, and then once you align the reads to the virus, you can do a filtering, an additional filtering, to, to ensure that you have uh, only reads that contribute to the overall consensus that you want to build. And one important aspect of this filtering that we do after alignment is we filter based on the insert size. So we keep a minimum insert of 60 basis and a maximum insert of 300 basis. And the reason for this is because, I, as I was describing before, 
the strategy that we use to create the libraries is an amplicon based strategy and we know the size of the amplicons which is supposed to be around 450 bases it varies depending on the amplicon but that means that when you take into account the size of the amplicon and the length of the read you don't expect um, reads to have any insert size above 300 really and it actually 300 is like a conservative estimate but um the reality is that if you do have an insert size that's larger than that, then it's probably a chimeric or some kind of um, misformed amplicon that you have in your in your library, and therefore you don't want those reads as part of what you use for building the consensus. So that's why this filtering step is very important. Um, after filtering, and uh, we move to the primer trimming, which I mentioned before, uh, we're doing um, using IVAR, which is also the tool that we use to do the variant calling and the tool that we use to do the consensus building. So IVAR is, um, it does kind of many things uh, as a tool, as a bioinformatics tool, but uh, the primer trimming is one of the most important ones. And I'm gonna show a little bit of this down the line, but early on when we were testing the pipeline and when we were testing the software, we realized that if you don't do, if you don't trim the primers, and the primers, uh, I'm gonna go back one slide just to show you again. Uh, the primers really are like the edges of the amplicons. Uh, they're, they're what you use to build the amplicons to do the, the actual PCR reaction. So um, if you don't trim them, you end up introducing a lot of sequencing artifacts into your analysis. And just because of the way PCR works, um, these primers tend to uh, obviously contain some artifacts uh, that might not be what you want in your analysis. And because you have overlaps in the in the amplicons, you don't actually need uh, to include the primers in your analysis. You were all you will always have the information that any primer would provide you uh, by using you know the other the other overlapping amplicon. So you really don't need them, and they only seem to introduce noise, and that's why we remove them as part of this um, primer trimming step. Um, and then once you do all of this alignment and filtering and trimming of the primers, then you can get into the actual work of the pipeline, which is doing the variant calling, as I, as I mentioned, and then building the consensus. And as I said before, for those, both of those things, we use IVAR as well. And um, I, I just have the chat open. If anyone has any questions, feel free to jump in in the chat, put them in the chat, or uh, if you want to say them verbally, just uh, say something in the chat. I have it open, and then we can we can listen to your question. So feel free to interrupt if, I if anything. Uh, that, uh, I will wait. Oh, sorry, I will wait to the end to not interrupt your flow. So okay, okay. Um, uh, so now that we do the the filtering and the trimming, we go move on to variant calling, and for that we use IVAR. So one thing to note here that's very important, at least uh, that was very important in our testing, is that we divided the IVAR calls into two, one for variant calling and one for consensus building. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, the virus mutates as it uh, infects a host, and some of those mutations are, are obviously um, novel or new, or you could be infected with a combination of viruses. And so you would expect some of the variants that you detect to not have a full variant allele frequency in a way. So not all of the reads in your library will carry a vir variant of interest or a variant that, that you might detect. And so we're obviously interested in variants that are not you know, the prevalent um, most uh, common variant in the sample. So we don't want to discard them completely, but when you're building a consensus, you really want to include only the variants that are most abundant in your library. And so because of those like competing interests, we do two different variant detections. One that is at a lower threshold uh, with a minimum frequency of 25, so 25% 25 of the reads have to carry a variant for it to be included in this variant calling. And then we, for this, we just produce a BCF. So a standard BCF with all the variants detected in the sample. And then we do a second IVAR call with a much higher uh, threshold of 75. And this is to build the consensus essentially. 
And the, obviously, you want to include only high variant allele frequency variants when you build the consensus. So that's why we do a separate variant calling step and a consensus building step uh, using IVAR, but still a, a, in a separate call so that you have kind of both uh, the VCF with all of the variants and then the consensus with only the high variant allele frequency variants. And then finally, uh, once we have, you know, the consensus, which is going to be a FASTA file and the variants, which are going to be in a VCF, we can move on to calculate a number of um, QC metrics and, you know, technical metrics, such as, you know, the depth of coverage using the alignment that we have up here, um, the number of variants that we actually detect the um, percent of missing bases, which are represented as N in the, in the consensus, a number of those things that are very important down the line uh, to kind of get a sense of what we are actually detecting. Um, the, the, the other pipeline that we have is the one that we use for long reads, which is uh, obviously in our case, only, only right now it's Nanopore. And this pipeline is very similar. It's actually not yet uh, fully implemented in our gen pipes, um, framework because it's almost exactly what is being run um, by the Arctic network. And so uh, I'm going to very quickly go over what how it works, but it's in a, in a principle very similar to what I just described, except with a, just a different order uh, mostly. So one thing to note is that when you have long reads, especially long reads that cover pretty much the whole Amplicon, um, there really is a much lower risk of uh, including host information when you just use a regular alignment. Because uh, in a short read, it's it's more expected that maybe a, a shorter region could map to the human genome and to the virus genome. But a long amplicon, a full amplicon, would rarely map into the human genome and to the virus genome. So if you just map to the virus genome, you pretty much keep only the virus uh, reads and then uh, not, not much else. So um, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, in most reads, in, in most cases, we don't do the base calling um, on our end. We have kind of shifted to doing that on the Promethean instrument, which comes with the base calling capabilities on its own. But if we have to do the base calling, we use the guppy base caller with high accuracy, which is what the Promethean is doing anyway. It's just a base caller for Nanopore um, reads that uses it, turns the signal data into fast cues, essentially, that we can use down the line. Um, then, as I mentioned, uh, the filtering, pre-filtering before doing alignment is very important. In this case, we're doing it mostly based on size. So again, because we know the size of the amplicon, we can set a relatively stringent threshold. So a minimum length of 400 and a maximum length of 700. Uh, and that usually filters out most of the noise. Then um, you do an indexing step that is required for Nanopolish, uh, which is the, the version of the pipeline that we're using. Um, it, it requires a, 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 an index. And so we build that index. And then once you have that index, essentially you do the alignment using Minimap, which is a long read aligner. Um, again, an alignment to just the viral genome. You filter your aligner uh, alignment again to kind of like make sure that you have only high quality uh, alignments. And here we do another um, step that's kind of important. We normalize coverage. So because long read alignments and long reads in general tend to occupy a lot more space and require a lot more computing resources, we have to normalize down, especially for regions that we have a lot of coverage. Um, so essentially what we do with any region that has more than 800x coverage per strand, we normalize down randomly to 800x coverage per strand. Um, and then after doing that, we do the variant calling again in two steps, but this time it's a little bit different than in the Illumina pipeline because we do have the full amplicons in this case. What we do is we divide the amplicon pools into two sets that, um, if you remember, there's overlaps in, in the amplicons. Uh, what we're doing here, the two pools that we divide this into, it's just to avoid the overlaps essentially so that you can do the variant calling kind of separately and then once you do the variant calling separately using Nanopolish, then you kind of merge your variant calls 
and check that the variants that fall in the overlapping regions kind of match. And um, that's more or less how it works in the nanopore um, side. I don't want to talk too much about this because I'm already going over time, but um, if you have more questions, we can we can talk about what this actually means. But it's just a different, uh, a different approach that would be using the Illumina because in the Illumina, we don't have a full amplicon in every read, um, whereas with nanopore we do. So we can do something like this. Um, and then uh, once you have the variant, you filter them. And then another thing that we do differently with the nanopore pipeline compared to the Illumina is that in the nanopore pipeline, because um, of the way that you know nanopore reads tend to be much more uh, noisy than Illumina reads, we kind of build a consensus uh, using the reference as a kind of like template. And then we just mask any low coverage regions. So regions that where we don't have sequencing data for, we just mask them. And then using the variants that we detected in this previous step, we kind of like changed the, the uh, reference to match the variant that we detected, as opposed to just building um, a pileup of reads and then using that to build the, the the consensus just because nanopore reads tend to be a lot more noisy and so it makes sense to kind of use the reference as a template. Um, the nanopolished variant color will tell you where the variants are and then you just mask anything that has low coverage. Um, and then once you have the, the consensus, uh, again, you use uh, your alignment and your consensus and your VCF to compute uh, several um, uh, statistics and that's how the nanopore pipeline works. So, um, you know, this, these pipelines are kind of standard. Uh, they're very similar to what is used uh, elsewhere in the world and uh, in ca Canada, but uh, that doesn't mean we didn't test them. And I'm just showing you kind of like the tests that we did. So at the beginning of the project, we actually had a number of samples that we sequenced with Nanopore with Illumina and with MGI, which is another kind of short read sequencer. And we compared the results that we got from each of these sequencers and from e the two different pipelines. So the short read pipeline that um, we use for Illumina and the long read pipeline that we use for Nanopore. And at the beginning and changing a number of parameters and one parameter that really was very striking about when we did these initial tests was the primer trimming with IVAR when we didn't do primer trimming uh, you can see here um, in this, this is a, a figure with some tracks and the lines here, the blue lines and the red lines represent variants that are detected. Um, and, and the blue is a nanopore and the red is the MGI data. Um, and the MGI had a bunch of these variants that we were finding um, in that, but not in the Illumina data. Um, and er early on when we were testing the parameters, this was when we were, weren't doing primer trimming. But then when we started doing the primer trimming, and you can see here, like I'm representing it with a lot more gaps in the, in the coverage for the um, uh, MGI portion, you can see that we trimmed the primers with IVAR, then we had full concordance between the two technologies. So it really showed us how, how like artifacts can be introduced when, when you use the primers, uh, when you have the primers there in, in the IVAR, at least for IVAR and for a short read seem to, cause a lot of noise and issues. And so the primer trimming turned out to be very important. As I mentioned, the other thing that we did was compare the, all three technologies. We wanted, we were specifically interested to see if there were any advantages or disadvantages to using kind of like MGI and CleanPlex, this other protocol versus Arctic and Illumina or Nanopore, which we know is more noisy, but we wanted to see kind of like how much more. So we had uh, 41 clinical samples that we received early on in the pandemic. We compared the results across all three technologies. And the good news was that in 38, in 38 of these 41 samples, we had full concordance, full concordance of all the variants that we found. Back then, we didn't have any indels. It was early on in the pandemic, so there weren't a lot of cases of indels, at least not in these samples. So there were just SMB calls. But um, in, in 38 of the samples, there was full concordance. Um, and you can see the actual calls that we had here. Um, there were some calls that were very frequent, some SMBs that were very frequent in this initial analysis. 
but uh, of course we were interested in the cases where there was no concordance, there was some discordance. And in, in two of the cases, it was pretty simple. It was usually a case where one of the technologies didn't have coverage for that particular region. And so it missed the variant, which was kind of like expected. You can see that at least in this cartoons, we have differences in the coverage. Um, with the MGI in this early test, we had really very, very deep coverage. It was kind of like a, an exception. We wouldn't have sequenced this deep if we had moved on with this technology. It would have looked more like the, the other two technologies where we had a bit more of a uneven coverage across the, the genome. But uh, there was one case where we had coverage. We just had a variant that was being detected in one of the technologies and not in the other two. And when we look closer into it, we, we realized that this variant, uh, this position, had a, a variant allele frequency of 75%. So 75% of the reads more or less carried the variant, whereas 25% um, didn't. And this was actually fairly consistent across all three technologies. So you can see here, I'm, I'm showing this one uh, sample, all of the variants that it had. So in Illumina and MGI, you can see that it's very, very consistent. And, and most of the variants had uh, like one um, or 98, like, variant allele frequency, which means that almost all of the reads carried the variant. But this one particular variant had 0.74 in Illumina and then 0.749, which actually it's actually 0.75 in MGI. And as I mentioned, we had a threshold set 75%. So we were just kind of like missing it in one, but capturing it in the other when we compared the, the consensus. Um, with Nanopore, you can see kind of like the impact uh, of the the noise level in the reads, as you can see, the variant allele frequencies all over the place. In Nanopore, we, our, our thresholds are actually much more lenient than with Illumina and MGI because of, because of this variation that we see. But even here, you can see that like this particular position was kind of on the lower end of the spectrum in terms of variant allele frequency. So it kind of showed us and, and motivated a lot what we did when separating the variant calling for building a consensus versus for just detecting variants. And then we also had a very interesting analysis that we did early on where the lab uh, at McGill spiked two uh, samples. One was a control and another was a clinical sample that we already had the sequence for. And they just did a, a progressive spike in of uh, one sample in the other at 1% uh, uh, concentration. 5% uh, concentration, 10%, 20%, and 50%. And the idea was that we had variants that were present in the control that were not present in the clinical sample and vice versa. I think there were a couple instances of SMB that were present in one but not the other. And we, what we wanted to see was whether when we spiked in the sample, we would see that increase in the you know, variant allele frequency, giving us kind of like a sense of whether our, our techniques were sensitive enough to find the low variant allele frequency variants. And it, it is pretty clear, at least in the short reads, we did it for nanopore and it wasn't that clear in the nanopore data, unfortunately, but in the Illumina data, which is the, what I'm showing here, when you don't have any spike in, you have almost, you know, 100% of the reads have this one variant that was not present in the other sample. But as you increase the spiking concentration, you see that the number of reads that carry the other variant, uh, the other base in this position goes increases uh, in, in a similar proportion. So uh, to the point where when we have the 50-50 spiking, the, you know, 40% of the reads had one of the bases, 59% of the reads had uh, uh, the other base. It's not exactly 50-50, but it's pretty close. So it, it kind of showed us that we could uh, conceivably detect low variant allele frequency variants, um, even uh, especially with the short read data. So as, as the pr uh, pandemic progressed and as we moved on um, doing more and more sequencing, especially with a a nano, um, Illumina sequencing, which, is, which was still our, our main sequencing platform, we encountered a number of issues. And this is something that probably any lab that you talk to that has done sequencing at a large scale for uh, COVID will tell you. For example, one of the main things that we struggle with um, in the lab is that COVID is a, 
obviously very contagious, but also um, it, you're doing amplicon uh, based analysis here, you're doing amplification. So any potential contamination will get picked up by the PCR and be amplified essentially. And this leads to a lot of um, negative controls that are not empty as you would expect a negative control. Depending on when you do the negative control, uh, we have a number of them uh, then you would detect different um, number of reads in your negative controls. It could be a problem because it could be indicative of contamination in the actual samples. So we see kind of like sometimes a very low uh, depth of coverage, um, uh, just spread of reads across the whole genome in a negative control, which could be indicative of like background noise. And so when we see something like that, what we do is kind of like, reanalyze everything at a higher threshold to kind of account for this potential background noise when we see this kind of um, contamination. Or sometimes what you see is just like one or two amplicons that are present in the negative control, but at a super high depth of coverage, um, like you can see in the two examples here. So in, this, in these cases, because if it is contamination and it did affect other samples, then there's really not much you can do. You can't up your thresholds that high. So in this case, kind of like the, the solution is just to mask the amplicons that are affected. Um, that's more or less what everyone in Canada uh, at the Cancogen level has agreed to do when you see these kinds of things. Another thing that we've seen um, going uh, in the, into the pandemic is that the, the, the number of samples that had very low quality was increasing over time. So uh, one thing that we knew from very early on uh, in our tests is that, uh, you know, you have CT value, which is the value uh, that is uh, very closely correlated to the amount of virus that you have when you take the sample, the viral load. So higher CT values mean that there was a lower uh, viral load at the beginning. And so uh, there was this threshold that was set early on when like around 32 CT value you start to get very poor results. And you can see it here. Um, this is kind of like the number of human reads that you find uh, in any given sample. And then when you go above 32, which are all the cases in red, the number of human reads in your sample starts going up quite a bit, which means kind of like you, you don't really have that many virus reads and your quality is impacted. And you can also see it in the number of missing bases in the consensus which goes up quite a bit um, as you have higher CT values. Um, these were all outliers. They were just samples that generated very few reads to begin with. And that's why the, the size of the dots is so small. So um, that's why they have high percentages of N in their consensus. But in cases where we have uh, quite, you know, quite a bit of reads, we still have a very high percent of N in the consensus. And that's usually related to the, the CT value. The problem is that for Quebec samples, we don't always have a CT value because depending on how the test was done, the diagnosis test for a particular patient, this information is not always available. And so our hypothesis was that we had places that were giving us a lot of samples that had very high CT values and we were sequencing them anyway because we didn't know the CT value. And then we had this very low success rate when we actually looked at the results and we identified two sites like that where the success rate was 16%, you know, like 16% of the samples we got from a particular site passed our QC metrics, which is extremely low. So one thing that we noticed is that when you do the amplification for the amplicons, uh, you can measure the concentration of DNA after the amplification. And, you know, below a certain concentration, you really, um, and this plot, what I'm showing in blue are the samples that failed our QC metrics. So, you know, and, and in the X axis, you have the PCR concentration. So after doing your amplification, building your amplicons, preparing your library, if you have a, a concentration above, uh, this is about 20 nanograms per microliter, um, you have a very high chance that your that your um, sample will pass our QC metrics. Is all these green samples that did you see here? But if you if you have below twenty nanograms per microliter, it, the chances that the sample just won't work are increased very dramatically. 
And so one thing that the lab started doing when we realized this is, okay, we're not gonna sequence anything that has less than 20 nanograms per microliter. And so in one of the, pr the production run right after we started implementing that filter, we had extremely high success rate. And you know, that kind of shows you how important it is um, to do this kind of filtering. And so just to uh, finish, because I know I'm running out of time, uh, the kind of results that we've obtained, I think some of you heard about this uh, early on, we published uh, last year in September, thanks to the work from postdoc and one of the labs associated with us, Carmen uh, Leah Moral. We published a portrait of the early epidemic in Quebec and the introduction events. And one of the things that we saw um, was that the early spring break in Quebec seemed to be the driver of the initial infections that we detected. And we did this by comparing all the samples that we sequenced to samples from other places. And we saw matches to popular spring break destinations. Um, and uh, the B1 clade uh, seemed to be the one that established itself the most in the, in the early first wave of the pandemic in Quebec. And so uh, in 2020, for this project, we had more than 50 sequencing runs across three technologies. We sequenced more than 6,400 samples, um, including several outbreaks that we use Nanopore for the outbreak analyses. And uh, we published more than 750 consensus sequences in Gisade in 2020. Obviously, these numbers have gone up in the first two months of this year because uh, we have been ramping up our sequencing capabilities to detect these new variants of concern. And so actually, as part of my conclusions is that, you know, um, open data and open science have made a lot of this work possible. So sharing data and expertise with other provinces and with other countries has really been the reason why we could do all of this in the first place. Um, bioinformatics infrastructure and expertise is super important, especially to detect these new variants of concern and to kind of do this kind of analysis, you really need bioinformatics expertise. And uh, thankfully that's what we have at the Genome Center and at C3G and across Canada. And so we have been taking advantage of all of those resources. And you know, this project has provided valuable information for genomic surveillance, which is this kind of detecting of the variants of concern and a retrospective analysis of the epidemic, kind of like what we did with the early introduction events uh, and spring break in the first wave. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the people that worked on this project, um, especially people from our team. Uh, you know, Guillaume Bourque is her leader, Mathieu Bourgie, who is the um, head of the tech dev team, Paul, who developed a uh, all of the Illumina pipeline and did a lot of the work as well. Sentil, who uh, is also contributing a lot, and Pierre Olivier, who is our liaison with Company Canada. And, you know, all of the work in the lab done by Yanis Ragusa's team, especially uh, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Railing, who does a lot of the sequencing. And with that, I'll take any questions that um, I know that I don't know how much time we have for questions, but I'm happy to take any questions. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? On va peut-être en prendre un petit peu moins que d'habitude parce que on a un peu dépassé le temps. Mais, oui, euh, <rire> mais non, mais c'est parfait. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y avait des questions? Ah, moi, j'ai des questions, mais peut-être que si tu veux, je veux peut-être choisir la plus pertinente. <rire> Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui, on t'entend. Oui, oui. Vas-y avec la plus parfait. pertinente. Parfait. Il faut juste que je divise mes fenêtres, ça. Euh, moi, mes questions, surtout, ben, des questions, uh, do I ask them in English or in French? En français, en anglais, ça I would ask them in English because I wrote them in English, so yes. Okay. I'm sorry I interrupted you. It's fine, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so my first question is the, uh, is a, uh, so, but I think I think I have the answer. So, uh, the in in new core in, in CBI, there is something called COVID Archum prefreeze. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, like Montreal COVID genomes. So I guess and they they say Arctic as the assembly method. So is this yours? Um. I'm not sure. I we don't do the updating to NCBI and GISAID. Um. So the NCBI data, I think, is updated by the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, and the, the GISAID data is updated by the ENSPQ at Quebec. So um, 
Oh, we, okay. we are just doing the bioinformatics processing. I'm not sure which data you refer to, but a lot of the data I can tell you. Yeah, but I post the, the link, but it seems that Google is censoring my links. It was a link to NCBI, so but they don't appear in my in the chat, so. Okay, yeah, but, I'm not uh, sure uh, exactly. Let's go to the next question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, the majority of the data from this state is, is ours, but the NCBI data, I'm not sure. I'm just saying that, okay, okay. So the, my next question is, uh, uh, yeah, so your method is, uh, is mostly doing basically alignments of reads to a reference. Then you gather the, the variance or the changes and then you apply basically a patch to get the sample the genome, if I understand correctly. So my question is the following. Is the SARS-CoV-2 genome uh, subject to a uh, structural variation during the process of evolution? By the way, my question are in the chat if my accent is too uh, EV. No, it, it's, it's fine. Um, so yeah, the structural variance uh, is something that we would normally expect to see, but probably not at the scale that is necessarily of interest yet. Um, it's, it's very likely that the majority of those structural variants will not be successful anyway. So right now we're not looking for them exactly. We're just focusing on SNBs and indels, uh, especially because indels and deletions are proven to be some of the most interesting variants, especially for these variants of concerns. So those we do expect to see and we do look for, but big, large structural variants, it's not something we're looking for. Okay, uh, Geneviève, I go on with my next question or, or uh, the thing Maybe is, uh, a, a last one, yeah. Maybe okay, just so a I quick one, yeah. carefully, yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my, my last question would be, uh, do you try to, to, uh, to phase the variant? Because in the, in the patient, like in, in its nose or lungs or trachea, or, or I don't know where the virus lives in the patient, but I, surely I know that uh, there is not just one uh, virus in the host, there are many, and they mutate. So the variants that you have in your assembly, do you try to phase them to obtain haplotypes? Um, that's not something we're currently doing. And the reason for that is that uh, it, it is with short reads, especially, it's very hard to do that because the short read will, will obviously not, um, will not have a lot of information about that. But um, the other thing is that because this is an amplicon based strategy, you could only phase within an amplicon because the other problem that you run into is that once you do amplicon the amplification, then uh, you obviously lose any information linking amplicons together. They're kind of become their own independent thing. So uh, oh, the only way that you could link them would be two other variants within that same amplicon. You could do an intra amplicon phasing. Um, and you kind of can do that with nanopore because the read covers the whole amplicon. But right now we're not doing like full uh, haplotype detection across the whole virus genome because that's a limitation of this kind of amplicon based strategy. And okay, and just uh, it's not another question, it's just uh, like a second turn. So uh, could you use technologies like Tenix to phase the. Uh... The Certainly, in, uh, genome yeah, like that, but I think, just too small. I think you could. Uh, honestly, the easier solution would just be to sequence the the virus without doing amplification using long reads, kind of like with with uh, nanopore. I think that would be much easier than than going the ten x route. But um, we're not currently doing that, uh, just because the, the the amount of data that you have to like you really have to have a big viral load for that to work. And, you know, finding that kind of sample is difficult and preparing it and the, the focus yeah. is really on getting real time results. So that's not currently so within I, the school. I would just... Uh, by, we... Yeah, I don't want to interrupt you, uh, Sebastian, but I think uh, time is up now. 
So okay. we'll... I just posted the what is Scrum in the in the chat. If you want to discover a better format than BAM. Thank yeah, you. we use Cram for other analyses. You know, virus sequences are so short that we can get away with using BAMs, and it, it's fine. We do, we're not in the problem of running out of space yet. Okay. Ben, merci Unless beaucoup. you sequence one billion samples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, so uh, today, the topic I want to be talking about is, uh, I think, a very important one uh, for anyone who analyzes uh, cancer data. And it's about how we can estimate and control for differences in cell type proportions and the analysis of bulk RNA-seq data. And I think some of the stuff I'll be presenting today is not only relevant for cancer, but might be uh, relevant for other diseases, um, such as Alzheimer's disease, where when you're comparing uh, patients, for example, who have Alzheimer's to patients who have non-Alzheimer's, uh, if you're comparing, for example, RNA sequencing from their brains, you know, one set of patients has fewer uh, neurons than the other set of patients uh, because of neuronal cell death. Um, so this, this topic is important uh, for, for a lot of uh, analyses. Um, and so, uh, but today mainly I'm going to talk about, uh, about this topic in the context of melanoma and cancer. Uh, uh, so most of my PhD work uh, has focused on studying melanoma. For those of you who don't know, cutaneous melanoma is a type of cancer that originates from the skin, and uh, uh, ultraviolet radiation is a very important uh, uh, is a very important mutagenic factor in in the uh, in the genesis of uh, cutaneous melanoma. And because cutaneous melanoma has one of the highest mutation burdens across cancers, it's very, uh, it produces a lot of, the mutations produce a lot of neoantigens, and this attracts a lot of immune cells to the tumor. And so uh, uh, this and the localization of melanoma tumors can impact the cell types present in surgically sampled tumors. So when you want to take out a, a tumor from the patient to sequence it or do methylation profiling on it, you know, Depending on the uh, depending on the amount of immune cells in the tumor and where the tumor is from, you could find different cell types and uh, different tumors from the same patient or from different patients. Um, and with respect to RNA seq data, you can see differences in cell proportions. Uh, 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 represented by uh, large-scale differences in gene expressions across samples. So for example, on the right is a heat map showing you the uh, expression of the 1,500 most variable genes in cutaneous melanoma. And uh, what you see over here is uh, at least uh, uh, three uh, clear, very clear, or four clear clusters. Um, this one is characterized by expression of immune cells uh, that are not coming from mel melanoma cells. Uh, and and over here, you have a, a bunch of genes that are expressed by epithelial cells such as keratinocytes, skin cells. So when you cluster tumor samples uh, uh, based on, uh, based on RNA-seq data without taking this into account, you get these clusters of patients that are not ne necessarily representative of the gene expression signature of the tumor, but uh, they're, uh, they're representative of other cells that are there. And... Uh, this needs to be taken into account when you're uh, trying to subtype patients based on their expression signatures. And this is not just uh, exclusive to melanoma. Um, a lot of tumor, uh, uh, almost all cancers have a lot of variation in their tumor purity. Um, uh, melanoma is over here, and you can see that a, a subset of the patients are relatively uh, pure, whereas a lot of uh, patients have a lot of inf infiltrating or contaminating cells. And you can see this for a lot of other cancers as well. Um, so there are two questions of interest that I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, the first one is how we can estimate tumor purity from RNA sequencing data. And uh, more interestingly, how we can get the proportion of specific cell types in tumors. And the second thing that I'll discuss is how we can adjust for variation uh, in purity uh, and cancer type proportion when we're analyzing RNA-seq data. Uh, and I don't talk about this in this presentation, but you know, a lot of the techniques I'll be presenting might be relevant to other data sets as well, such as methylation data uh, and uh, proteomic data. 
So, uh, you know, typically, uh, a, a, at least for the TCG8 cancers that we're using, so the, the TCG8 is a big project that was used to sequence thousands of cancer types, for, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, thousands of samples from different cancer types. And uh, we have methylation data, RNA-seq data uh, for these samples. We have proteomic data, DNA copy number data. So it's really a multi-omic, uh, a large multi-omic data set. And uh, uh, Along with this data set, uh, uh, there are estimates of tumor purity. And these uh, tumor purity are uh, estimates based on uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, so one way of estimating tumor purity, and the simplest way, is just by uh, using hist immunohistochemistry, by looking at the tumors on slides and seeing how many uh, immune cells are on the tumors. Um, but this is not necessarily very accurate. So there are other ways that we can estimate tumor purity from the data itself, from the sequenced or profiled tumor itself. And so there are crude methods of doing this. And by crude, I don't mean, you know, ballpark. They're, they're very precise in their measurements, but they don't give you exact cell proportions. They just give you an overall proportion of uh, cancer cell types in the tumor. Um, and this can be based on DNA copy number profiles. Uh, you know, if, if available, you could use that. Or you could use the medium variant allele frequency uh, somatic, uh, somat for somatic mutations, if you have enough somatic mutations uh, in the cancer. Um, so uh, if you have a mutation, for example, on one copy of, of the chromosome in the cancer cell, uh, 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 you expect a 50% variant allele frequency, but depending on the presence of normal cells in the tumor, that allele frequency will decrease and can be informative of the purity of the tumor. Um, uh, other techniques, computational techniques that uh, are useful are supervised, uh, are supervised approaches uh, that are either deconvolution based, so they decompose the tumor into different gene expression signatures belonging to different cell types, um, or they're gene uh, set enrichment based. Um, and in those types of uh, cases, you have uh, gene signatures that are cell type specific and you could look at their enrichment in a particular tumor to tell how much of the cell approximately is in the tumor relative to other cells. And there are also unsupervised computational approaches. Uh, 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 and these, uh, I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not being exhaustive here, uh, but uh, deconvolution techniques based on matrix factorization are one. Um, and so I just have this figure here to highlight, uh, to highlight you know, the, uh, the problem with immunohistochemistry, which is based on you know, uh, just looking at the uh, tumor slides on microscopes. So over here is the correlation between the estimates of tumor purity from IHC and various computational methods. So every other, so over here, the dash separates uh, the methods used for purity estimation. Um, I won't go into details here. The only thing you need to focus on is uh, uh, IHC. Uh, all the other methods that are used are computational. Um, and if you look at the correlation between IHC and every other computational methods, you'll see that the correlation, uh, uh, the agreement between IHC and computational methods is very poor. And, uh, you know, this is not because the computational estimates are bad. From my experience, this is because the IHC estimates are either imprecise or, or just are not capturing uh, the the variation in the actual sequence tumor because the sample you see in IHC is not necessarily the sample that you sequ uh, the, the part of the sample that you sequence. Um, so uh, I'll focus here on, on three te computational techniques that we can use to infer uh, tumor purity based on genomic data because uh, the IHC data isn't that great. Uh, uh, and uh, one of these techniques is DNA copy number based. So we can use DNA, the DNA copy number profile of tumors to estimate their purity. Um, the other is uh, based on a tool called Excel, which is a supervised gene set enrichment approach for estimating the relative enrichment uh, of cell types using RNA-seq data. Um, and, and it's trained to do this in a very nuanced and, and, uh, and uh, interesting way but I won't go into that. Uh, and uh, the last technique I'll be talking about is the unsupervised use, the use of non-negative matrix factorization uh, uh, to estimate you know, relative cell type abundances in tumors um, using bulk RNA-seq data. So most of this presentation is focused on RNA-seq. So I'll begin with absolute. Uh, so what uh, absolute does is it, absolute, uh, is it uses the relative copy number ratios from copy number arrays 
or whole genome sequencing to determine tumor purity, tumor ploidy, as well uh, as an added bonus, it gives you the uh, absolute copy number uh, profile of tumors. So typically these data sets that we get for copy number are rep represented in ratios. Uh, absolute converts them into absolute uh, copies. And over here is a demonstration of how copy number can be used uh, to uh, measure the purity of a tumor. So over here is a uh, pure tumor and its impure counterpart. They both have the exact same copy number, alter, uh, copy number alterations. Um, the ploidy is four in this, cancer, uh, in this cancer. So most of the genomic regions have a copy number of four. And you have a few copy number alterations here and there. You know, when you add normal cells to that tumor, uh, uh, when you add when you add the source of impurity, you know these 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 uh, copy number alterations get compressed. So based on the pattern of copy number alter alterations and their uh, and their uh, you know relative distance from the from the ploidy of the tumor, you can infer the co the, the amount of impure normal cells uh, uh, that are contributing to the to the tumor uh, over here. So, um, so we did this for approximately 440 melanoma samples from the TCGA. We ran absolute on these. And over here, I show you the distribution of purity uh, from these uh, different, uh, uh, for these different samples. You can see that a lot of them are very impure. And we look, when we look at the correlation of purity and uh, the gene-wise uh, uh, expression uh, of, of uh, genes across the samples, uh, you can see that a lot of genes are very strongly negatively correlated with purity. Um, uh, these are genes that are belonging to immune cells, as you'll uh, as you'll see uh, in a later slide. So uh, now that uh, we know Absolute has given us purity estimates, we can use them to uh, uh, we can use them to remove the effect of cancer purity uh, from gene expression data. Uh, and how, uh, uh, how we did this, so uh, we did this in a paper I recently published with uh, Mathieu, uh, who, who's, I think, one of the organizers. And uh, so what we did was we took, we, we, we took the genes that were positively correlated with purity. So these are genes that are specific to the melanoma cells. And we subtracted the effect of purity on their mRNA expression. We clustered the tumors based on the purified gene expression values. And we clustered the tumors, and over here I show you the clustering overlaid on a principal component analysis plot. And you can see that this approach gives us three nice clusters corresponding to the cancer cells. Uh, and uh, you know, unlike the clustering that I showed you in, in the earlier slide with the heat map, uh, you know, they, these are exclusively cancer intrinsic uh, clusters. They're not affected by uh, uh, by the uh, immune cells that infiltrate the tumor. Um, and we'll go back to these later, and I'll tell you more about these clusters later. But before that, I want to talk about how uh, we, as a complementary, uh, as a complementary uh, approach to what we did uh, with the absolute purities, um, we used non-negative matrix factorization and the tool Excel to try to learn about the composition of the melanoma tumors from uh, RNA sequencing data sets. So uh, there are two great packages for performing non-negative matrix factorization in R. Um, I list them here. Uh, you could look at them uh, later. I think this video will be posted. Um, but uh, they have different algorithms uh, to solve the factorization problem and determine the optimal decomposition rank. And so the idea behind net negative matrix factorization is, you know, you have a, 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 an array of tumor samples uh, that have different cellular composition. And what tumor non-negative matrix factorization can be used to do uh, is it, uh, uh, it decomposes the, the gene expression signature of the tumors into uh, cancer-specific uh, 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 gene expression profile, uh, cancer cell-specific gene expression profiles, as well as infiltrating cell gene expression profiles. And, uh, and it gives you the relative weight of each of these expression, uh, gene expression signatures in a sample. So basically, each sample is modeled as a as a linear combination of the expression profiles of, of the expression profiles of specific cell types. And then what you could do is you could take the weights of these different uh, cell types and and uh, and basically cluster the two samples based on their cancer cell uh, cancer cell signatures. 
independently of their infiltrating uh, infiltrating cell signatures. And you could do a lot of interesting survival analysis on the signatures independently of each other. And I'll show you this uh, uh, in a later slide, and, and it, 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 it looks quite beautiful. Um, so we applied non-negative matrix factorization to the RNA-seq data from the TCGA samples, and we determined that, uh, that you know, uh, the, the, uh, the expression signatures are based on uh, uh, our, our, uh, our components uh, have five individual components. Uh, so they're a linear combination of five expression signatures. We named these signatures keratin, immune, oxfos, MITF, low, and common. I won't spend too much time uh, talking about how we came up with these names, but it was briefly based on gene set enrichment analyses and additional complementary analyses. Um, and what we did was we first studied the relationship between these components and absolute purity. So this is the weight matrix I talked about earlier. So this matrix over here is, is the same as this matrix over here. This gives you the contribution of each one of the cancer uh, it's, it's cellular signatures to the, to the different samples. So the, the columns are the samples here. And you can see that the common MITF low and OXFOS signatures were positively associated with absolute purity, suggesting that these signatures are cancer intrinsic, um, whereas the keratin and immune signatures were negatively associated with, uh, with tumor purity, um, suggesting that they're coming from non-cancer cells. And so, to further understand, you know, the composition of the of the of the uh, of the different uh, TCGA cancers, we uh, we used X cell to determine the relative enrichment of different cell types per uh, uh, per each melanoma samples. So, X cell just gives you the, the relative proportion of approximately sixty cell types per sample. And what we did was we looked at the correlation between the enrichment scores for these cell types here shown on the X axis and the component scores from NMF. So the component scores from NMF are shown on the y-axis. And uh, what we see is that the immune signature was associated with a lot of uh, uh, different immune cells, um, which is why we called it the immune signature. The keratin signature was associated with keratinocytes, sebocytes, and epithelial cells. Now, what's interesting over here is that the OXFOS signature was associated with melanocytes, uh, with the melanocyte signature from X cell, whereas the MITF low and common signatures were associated with uh, were associated with uh, uh, neuronal uh, or uh, neural uh, uh, neural crest uh, neural crest associated uh, cell type signature, and this is very interesting because melanocytes uh, are uh, mel the the uh, cell of or origin for melanocytes is the neural crest. And uh, so what this data is telling it is that, is that the, OXFOS, uh, the OXFOS melanomas are more differentiated than the MITF low and the common uh, subtype melanomas. Um, and you can see this over here by looking at MITF expression. MITF is a marker of melanoma, melanocyte different, normal melanocyte differentiation. You can see that it's more highly expressed in the OXFOS and common subtypes. And you can see that you know, associated with this greater differentiation, uh, is uh, increased pigmentation of melanocytes. So melanocytes, uh, the, their function is to produce pigment and protect the skin from ultraviolet radiation. And you can see that differentiated melanocytes produce a lot of pigments, whereas less differentiated melanocytes produce less pigment. Um, now, uh, to give you an idea about the keratin, what we think of the keratin signature, we, uh, well, first, uh, but based on the EXA results, we found that this signature, if you look on the right, is associated with keratinocytes, which are skin cells, and uh, sebocytes, which are also skin cells. These are sebaceous gland cells. And we, when we looked at the enrichment score for this, uh, for this keratinocyte uh, compo keratin component across melanoma tumors of different origin, we only saw the signature strongly present in the primary tumors. So the primary tumors are the ones that come directly from skin. Um, and so we think that this is because they're only present in the signature is only present in primaries and not distant metastases or lymph nodes. We think that it's due to con contamination, and it really has no biological uh, relevance. Uh, and uh, so the last signature is the immune signature. Uh, and uh, what's interesting, uh, what's uh, what's interesting about the signature is now you don't have like what I showed you in the first heat map you don't have just one group of samples that are labeled immune. 
you can use the immune signature to stratify the samples into, into gradients of uh, into gradients of uh, uh, of immune infiltrate, and uh, you know different groups of samples depending on how much they're infiltrated by immune cells or depending on the strength of the immune signature. You know they have different survival. So the the samples that are more infiltrated by immune cells have better survival, uh, whereas the samples that are less infiltrated have worse survival. And uh, these uh, these NMF based signatures were in agreement with the uh, with the signatures we derived using the rudimentary approach based on the absolute purities and the subtraction of the effect of purity from uh, RNA expression. So that was that was reassuring. And so, uh, just to summarize over here, uh, you know, variations in tumor purity complicate the subtyping uh, of tumors based on RNA seq data. But you know, this is not only relevant to RNA seq data; it's 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 relevant to any kind of uh, uh, bulk uh, tumor profiling, such as methylation or DNA copy number. And it's very important to take uh, take this potential confounder into account in all statistical analyses of uh, bulk tumor data. Um, there, are, there are a lot of uh, complementary techniques that can be used to learn the composition of tumors, as I presented you with. Um, and once you learn this composition of the tumors, uh, you know, you can account for it in various statistical analyses to uncover interesting biology. And uh, one question that I thought of here uh, at the, uh, while I was, you know, right before I presented is, you know, why would we care about this in the age of single cell sequencing? And I think that it's because um, many researchers still uh, analyze uh, uh, bulk RNA-seq data. I mean, there, there are so many bulk RNA-seq data sets out there um, that it's, it's hard to just, you know, throw them, uh, throw them all out uh, and uh, move to single cell data yet. And it's not practical at the moment. Um, but they're rich in information, and I think that we haven't extracted all the information from these data sets. And if we want to properly extract information from these data sets, we need to account for variance, variations in tumor purity. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I have enough time. You know, I wanted to give just one example. Uh, Genevieve, maybe you could uh, tell, me if, uh, tell me if it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, it'll take okay. maybe two minutes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to show you one example of how we used... Uh, how we used our purified our purified gene expression signatures um, to uncover interesting biology. So uh, it, just just to uh, summarize again, you know, we uh, by accounting for tumor purity, we were able to uncover cancer intrinsic uh, uh, subtypes. Um, so these subtypes these subtypes of cancers reflect the can the cancer cell type in the patient. Well, uh, and uh, they subtract out the effect of uh, the effect of uh, immune infiltrating uh, immune infiltrates, um, and so uh, you know, unlike unlike what I showed you here, where we assigned the sample where, where the samples were assigned to um, to either immune or keratin or keratin subgroups, you know, we assigned the we assigned the cancers to cancer intrinsic subgroups. So we, we can, and, and what this does is it enhances our power to do statistical analyses uh, based on the cancer intrinsic subgroups. Uh, because we could, uh, we, you know, we're not discarding sample, we're not discarding samples that have immune infil high immune infiltration or high, high keratin expression. We know their actual cancer intrinsic subtype and we can, uh, uh, we can use those samples in statistical analysis rather than throw them out because they're impure. And so what we we looked at the association of these cancer uh, uh, of these cancer intrinsic uh, subtypes. We looked at the association between melanoma driver mutations and these subtypes. Uh, so over here is the color of the different subtypes, and we saw interesting associations between the mutation status of different cancer genes and uh, and different uh, and different uh, uh, melanoma subtypes, and. Uh, the one, uh, the one interesting relationship I want to focus on here is PRKA. Uh, there are very few PRKA, uh, PRKA or one A mutations in the data set that we were using, um, but these mutations uh, they were they were uh, almost exclusive to the to the OxFos group of samples. Um, these mutations were loss of function mutations uh, in PRKA or one A, so uh, they're associated with loss of function of PRKA. Um, and PRKA is involved in the uh, uh, 
uh, is involved in the cyclic AMP signaling pathway. So what this uh, what this gene uh, does is it's uh, uh, it essentially phosphorylates different proteins, um, uh, and uh, one of the consequences of this phosphorylation event is increased expression of the transcription factor MITF. So if you remember earlier, I told you that MITF is uh, uh, is associated with melanoma differentiation or melanocyte differentiation. So this is very interesting because we only see this mutation in the differentiated subtype of melanomas, the Oxfos subtype, which brings up the question, you know, is this mutation what's driving the tumors uh, into this Oxfos oxidative phosphorylation phenotype? Um, and what makes it also more interesting is because the ox oxidative phosphorylation subtype is associated with uh, in, uh, uh, is associated with resistant resistance to one type of melanoma treatment, BRAF, inhibit, uh, BRAF inhibitors uh, specifically. Um, so uh, this is just one of the interesting findings that, uh, that we, uh, we were able to see uh, once we looked at the cancer intrinsic uh, expression profiles. And we can also see that uh, not only by looking at mutations, but by looking at gene expression, that PRKAR1A expression is lower in the OXFOS sample. And it's... Uh, and the protein that inhibits PRKR1A, PRKACA, if you look at it over here, so the the inhibitor is uh, up uh, is is sorry, uh, the up the inhibitor is upregulated in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the oxfos uh, in the oxfos samples. Um, so. Uh, so in, in, in summary, just to summarize this finding, um, it's possible that PRKR1A uh, 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 loss of function may be uh, uh, responsible for driving melanomas away from this OXFOS phenotype. Uh, and this is consistent when you look at the mutation and when you look at the RNA expression data. And uh, uh, finally, I just want to acknowledge uh, um, especially, uh, my, my lab members, but especially Mathieu Lajoie, who uh, worked on me on publishing the results of the paper that, uh, yeah, uh, that I presented uh, today. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, please. Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? So maybe I have a quick question. Do you know how the factorization compare with the single cell RNA seq? Um, Would you get similar results? Yeah. So um, so okay. So for melanoma, uh, there has been a study uh, that's looked at uh, that's that looked at single cell RNA sequencing of uh, melanoma cell lines. And in those cell lines, you do see an OXFOS phenotype and an MITF low uh, and an MITF low phenotype. Um, so that's in agreement with with the with the signatures that our NMF is giving here. And uh, a long time ago, I the, uh, I used uh, I used I used single cell uh, sequencing uh, data set of for melanoma to try to classify uh, class, classify cells based on. Um, Based on uh, the expression signatures from NMF and uh, the classification, uh, the classification of the cell types, uh, you know, was very clear for the OXFOS and MITF low cell types. So the NMF signatures do tend to agree with uh, the signatures you get from single cell sequencing. Uh, the common signature. Uh, so I presented three signatures: OXFOS, MITF low, and common. We're still not sure what's happening with common. It seems to be similar to. Uh, the Oxfos uh, subtypes, but no other study has reported it. Uh, reported it um, uh, certainly not single cell uh, uh, sequencing studies for melanoma. They haven't reported the common subtype either. So we're doing more investigation on that subtype to be able to tell whether it's bona fide or whether it um, it's due to some uh, factor that we're just not aware of yet. Okay, thanks. Is there any other question? Is there any question? Uh, me, I would have a question, but it's not a topic that I'm very familiar with. So it's about the introduction. 
Yep. In the introduction, you talk about the uh, disease of the neural uh, nervous system briefly. I was wondering the link between that and your presentation. Is it the because both both like both topics can use RNSEC to study these uh, these diseases? Yeah. Um, so um, one, uh, I so I uh, I've been working uh, on uh, on a study involving Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and, this, and, and in that study, I'm comparing the transcriptomes of patients with Alzheimer's disease to patients, uh, uh, patients uh, 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 control patients. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily uh, uh, normal patients, but they're, they're control patients who don't have Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, you know, when you're comparing the differences in, uh, in the transcriptomes of these two groups of uh, samples, uh, you're going to see a lot of differences, but these differences are largely due to the depletion of neural cells in the Alzheimer's disease cohort. Um, as as uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this disease, but you know one of the major hallmarks of Alzheimer's is uh, loss of neuronal cells. Uh, the neural cell, the neuronal cells uh, gradually die um, over time in Alzheimer's disease patients. So you get a depletion in these cells. Um, so. When you're studying RNA-seq data sets of Alzheimer's disease, you're not interested in, in just the depletion, but what we want to do is we want to know exactly what's happening in the neuronal cells uh, using the RNA-seq data without the confounding effect of their uh, depletion uh, in the brain. Uh, I hope that answers your question, but I think this is, this is, where, uh, this is where some of the stuff I presented today uh, comes into play. Uh, and other uh, so uh, yeah, the Alzheimer, the uh, the cells die in the hippocampus, I think. That's not sure. But, but anyway. Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions? And this is a quite informal meeting, so there's. All, all kind of questions are allowed, as long as it's bioinformatics and related to the talk, but don't feel shy to ask a simple question. Is it time consuming to run these sorts of analysis that you presented in your talk? Um, I, in, in terms of CPU time, is uh, not necessarily human time? Um, I think you could, uh, everything, um, hold on. I think everything that I presented today can be run on a local computer. Uh, and NMF, depending on the number of samples and the number of genes that you give it, you know, can take uh, either one uh, one day to two days. It I mean, it depends on the resources that you have in your personal computer. But on on my on my computer, it's it generally takes uh, a day uh, to two days. Uh, um, the Excel, the Excel, uh, the Excel gene set cell type gene set enrichment. Uh, uh, takes only a few minutes, uh, so that's relatively quick. Thanks. Okay, I have one question. Yes, Matthew. <laughs> Do you have uh, some uh, shocking example of uh, uh, spurious correlation you can see when you? Don't take purity into account. Oh, well, uh, I think that a lot of studies uh, have. Uh, uh, okay, so a, a lot of a, a lot of recent uh, studies uh, are interested in uh, identifying biomarkers of response to immunotherapy, um, and. Uh, so they look at genomic data, and uh, they look at genomic data, and they, ch they try to uh, they try to identify uh, genomic markers that are uh, that distinguish response immunotherapy responsive patients to non-responsive patients. And uh, one of the uh, one of the biomarkers of response to immunotherapy is uh, immune cell infiltration. Um, so uh, patients who respond to immunotherapy has higher proportion of immune cells. And so as a result of the higher proportion of immune cells, you have less sensitivity in these samples to detect uh, somatic mutations and copy number alterations. And uh, this is one uh, uh, example of, uh, of why it's important 
to control for its uh, tumor purity. Uh, and I think that some of the uh, approaches that I presented here, including absolute, uh, absolute and NMF, uh, you know, can, can can help with that. Particularly absolute, if you're interested in interested in identifying uh, copy number alterations that are uh, associated with response to immunotherapy. Thank you.